So we're very grateful that he's here with us this evening to share his wisdom and years of experience with us. Your grace, welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to be back here at the Newman Center. I was here when Father Rossi had the project of putting these stained glass windows in. He was criticized a bit because some of the people were not yet made venerable or blessed or saints. Some of them have made it already. <laughs> Brother Andre and Saint Mar Maria, uh, Saint Mother Mary, Mother Saint Teresa of Calcutta, Francis Eberstetter. There are Giorgio Frasati's there, Gianni Bertamola, and of course we have the Vanyas. We're working on the cause of the Vanyas. We'll pray for them. I want to uh, begin by acknowledging uh, the role of Heritage Restoration, and Mr. Clay Huntley particularly, for being the sponsors of tonight's lecture. As well, donors of make events like this possible, and I want to acknowledge tonight John, John, John McDonald, Knights of Columbus Council of 1388 and Rosemary Jassan, among others. Finally, the Newman Foundation Board for their fundraising initiatives, Jim Milway, Chair of the Foundation Board, Sandra Murphy, Volkan Loom, Vicky McNally, and Natalie Majassan. When you invited me last spring to give this address, I was honored to be welcomed back to a center of Catholic life that occupied a special place in my early years as a bishop. I love connecting with the university students of the Newman Center. Their interests were different from those of the students I had as a teacher of scripture at the schools of theology in Halifax and Toronto. There, most of my students, usually seminarians at that time, were preparing for ministry in the Catholic Church or in several other Christian denominations, particularly the Anglican United Churches of Canada. For a year in Regina, I interacted with my theology and scripture course students at the Campion. In contrast, however, when I got here to Newman, the students were studying not theology and scripture, but every other kind of discipline in a wide range of faculties. Some were serving here as student campus ministers, a role that I also was happy to share with my nephew. And some were living in the intentional Christian community that resides in the residence next door. Our conversations covered everything you could imagine. Some were basic, others much more profound. I have to confess to you tonight that my initial reason for coming to Newman was for a parking space. <laughs> I wanted Father Rosica to let me leave my car in the parking lot here in the driveway while I was playing squash three times a week at the University of Toronto Sports Center. <laughs> I didn't want to risk a ticket for parking on the street for too long. Father Tom proposed a trade. I could park in exchange for coming into the center to talk to the students. He wisely thought that bishops should not be distant from the flock. Pope Francis would say that bishops should take on the smell of the sheep. I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> he also believed that young people should feel at home with the clergy. Thus began my three and a half years as the Newman Center Bishop. Incidentally, I wasn't unique. Father Rosica managed to lure other bishops into the Newman Center as well. But I don't think he had to promise them parking. This experience with students on every imaginable trajectory introduced me to the challenge of evangelization in our day. When I became an ordinary, as the bishop in Halifax, and more recently in Ottawa, I delighted in engaging with youth. I welcomed teams of young evangelists with net ministries. I got to know Catholic Christian outreach, Canadian Catholic campus ministry, and the Canadian Catholic Student Association. I helped a group of young men in Halifax establish a Pier Giorgio Frassati house, and some young women to form a discernment house that has ended up being a religious congregation. I went to World Youth Days, a journey with young people to studentville programs in East, Ohio, Toronto. I helped establish Dumaville Atlantic. In some ways, all this work with young people and youth began here. And so I thank you 
for your welcoming outlook. I pray that that spirit of welcome will continue. I certainly felt it this evening. By the way, using the pronoun we, we'll be playing it safe. We scatters responsibility. It's anonymous. But you is intrusive. It's forceful. Disruptive. I hope you'll be, you'll be open, to, open to being called you tonight in my talk from time to time. A deal? Sure. Okay, I think that is consent. <laughs> no one objected. <laughs> Tonight's topic is vast. Why I read the Bible today. But another way, is the Bible still relevant? I hope to show it is. However, in the end, that will be up to you to judge. The subtitle of my talk is even more ambitious. I didn't draw it up. It's an in-depth in -depth analysis of what makes the Holy Bible relevant in today's secular world. I hope to prove the claim by presenting several ways in which the Bible compels its readers and hearers to a different view of the world and their place in it. In September, I read an article in the Catholic Register on a conference in Woodbridge given by a Jesuit from Egypt. He told how the Bible helped him to read the situation in Syria from a faith perspective. For those looking to understand the situation in Syria as war continues to ravage the country, the article began, Father Henry Boulard suggests turning to the final book of the Bible. If you want it in a simple way, he said, this is the big fight between good and evil. If you open the book of Apocalypse, you will see why. The war which has raged since 2011 reflects the symbolic struggle in Revelation between the beast and the woman with the newborn child. On one side, you have a terrible dragon, just a blind force and power, which is the governments and nations and armies, he said. On the other side, you have power, a powerless, powerless people incarnated and symbolized as the woman and the newborn child. According to the United Nations, the war was forced, has forced about four million Syrians to become refugees. We've seen the images on television over and over. More than 30,000 of these have come to Canada. Tens of thousands of people, mainly civilians, have died in the war. The Syrian humanitarian group, I Am Syria, reports that 21,000 died in 2015 alone. Warring factions have targeted Christians and other religious minorities in particular. Bulan is the Jesuit religious superior in Alexandria and a former provincial of the Middle East province. The Cairo theology professor said that despite being disgusted and furious over the events in Syria, as a man of faith, he believes that the woman and the child will prevail over the beast, just as they do in Scripture. Good will overcome, love will overcome, justice will overcome, he said, but only after a tragedy which is happening underneath our eyes every day. The church's role is to remind us to tackle the issue in a spiritual and theological manner, especially regarding all suffering and mental anguish, he said. In other words, he applies the apocalypse to the situation in Syria and the Middle East generally. Father Balad believes that a text written in the late first century speaks to your day and the circumstances of your world. Not as a type of Roman Acre, where groups and individuals are identified, it's a text that speaks the perennial message of Jesus applied to new circumstances. In chapter 4 of the Apocalypse, after John has heard that the Lion of the tribe of Judah has won the victory, he looks up and sees not the powerful king of the jungle, but a lamb that is standing even though it bears the scars of having been slain. This is a parable of the risen Lord Jesus when he appears to his disciples in the upper room on the road to Emmaus and on the mountaintop of Galilee, still bears in his body 
the marks of the crucifixion. These are the five sacred wounds, the nail piercings in his hand and feet, and the mark of the soldier's lance in his chest, from which flowed blood and water. Later, the church would interpret this as a sign of foreshadowing the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. But God doesn't deal with evil by crushing it, but by absorbing it into the body of Christ with love. Another consequence is that the Bible is seen not as making Christians, along with Judaism and Islam, people of the book, but rather people of the word. The word speaks to you and to me today with an awesome power and immediacy. You may have heard that Pope Francis went to Lund, Sweden, on October the 31st to take part in the year marking the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, begun by Martin Luther on October the 31st, 1517. The question that haunted Martin Luther about God's mercy is the decisive question of our lives. In addition, the doctrine of justification expresses the essence of human existence before God. Pope Francis declared to a joint Catholic Lutheran gathering that day. In 1999, the Lutheran and Roman Catholic churches reached a groundbreaking agreement over the major theological issue behind the 16th century rift. The October 31st commemoration held at the start of the year marking the publication of Luther's 95 Theses was designed to help the two churches receive the fruits of that agreement the Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification. Applause, hymns, and the tolling of bells at Lund Cathedral greeted Pope Francis at the start of the service. The ecumenical prayer included a confession of the wrongs committed by both churches, as well as a celebration of the journey from conflict to communion. In his address, the Pope spoke of a new opportunity to accept a common path, opened by the 50-year dialogue between the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church, describing it as an opportunity to mend a critical moment of our history by going beyond controversies and disagreements that have often prevented us from understanding one another. Noting how the Catholic Protestant rift distanced us from the primordial intuition of God's people, who naturally yearned to be one, the Pope said that the division was perpetuated historically by the powerful of this world, rather than by the faithful little people. Certainly, there was a sincere will on the part of both sides at the time of the Reformation to profess and uphold the truth. But at the same time, we realized that we closed in on ourselves out of fear or bias with regard to the faith, which others profess with a different accent in a different language. The Pope pointed to two positive consequences of the Reformation. While separation has led to suffering and misunderstanding, it also has led us to recognize honestly that without Jesus, we can do nothing. And therefore, the Reformation has enabled us to better understand some aspects of our faith. The Reformation also helped give greater centrality to sacred scripture in the church's life. In fact, he would propose to you this evening that the issue at the time of the Reformation was how to read scripture in the context of the church's teaching authority to interpret the scriptures. Pope Francis added that in the concept of by grace alone, Luther reminds us that God always takes the initiative prior to any human response, even as he seeks to awaken that response. The Declaration on Justification says that both Catholics and Lutherans confess that by grace alone, in faith, and in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit. Here I want to note that while terms such as grace, faith, reconciliation, and justification appear in the Bible, nowhere do the Reformers cry by faith alone or by scripture alone. 
appear in the scriptures as the means leading to justification, reconciliation, and peace with God. Whereas the events organizers build the Pope's words as a common ecumenical prayer, they describe the address by the Reverend Mark Mjolga, the General Secretary of the World Lutheran Federation, as a sermon. Mjolga praised the men and women of the past from both churches who sought to overcome the Reformation divide through dialogue, prayer, and common works of charity. You will notice that the means to overcome divisions just mentioned include common works of charity. Works are the fruit of justification. Justification is unmerited and received in faith. Works are not the starting point, and this implies that God grants his beloved children to be made right in the divine perspective when they receive the gift of salvation through believing in God's love at work in the Paschal Mystery the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. They then find themselves driven by the indwelling spirit to serve their neighbor in good deeds. For example, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy that we've been highlighting in this Jubilee year of mercy. Jesus never forgot us, even when we at times appear to have forgotten him, losing ourselves in hate-filled, violent actions, Jung has said as he called for even greater dialogue. Both sides should now focus on the centripetal force, and not the centrifugal force, which separates us. The Catholic Church has long recognized the validity of Lutheran baptism, but strong differences remain over communion, despite both churches professing the reality of Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. Unlike Pope Francis, who made no mention of the question, Junga made clear that intercommunion was a shared goal of Lutheran Catholic unity dialogues. God, he said, would like to see Catholics and Lutherans coming together around tables where we can share the bread and wine, the presence of Jesus Christ, who never left us, and who calls us to remain in him so that the world might believe. For his part, Francis concluded, we Christians will be credible witnesses of mercy to the extent that forgiveness, renewal, and reconciliation are daily experienced in our midst. Without such witness, he said, Christian faith is incomplete. Since December the 8th, 2015, the whole church has been experiencing the joy of an extraordinary jubilee year of mercy. Everywhere he has been, and on countless occasions, Pope Francis has repeated that the biblical message of mercy is vital for the whole world today, for your world and for you. Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. There you have realized the whole mystery of the Christian faith. Pope Francis wrote this in the Bull of Indiction of the special Jubilee year, a few months before it started. The Jubilee year will close shortly with the liturgical solemnity of Christ the King. On that day, the Pope pledged, we shall be filled above all with a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving to the Most Holy Trinity for having granted us an extraordinary time of grace. We will entrust the life of the Church, all humanity, and the entire cosmos to the Lordship of Christ, asking Him to pour out His mercy upon us like the morning dew, so that everyone may work together to build a brighter future. So, the experience of Middle East Christians, the ecumenical project of moving to increasing gestures of reconciliation with our separated brothers and sisters of the Reformation, the importance of mercy in the life and mission of the Church. These headline stories are all rooted in the Bible. They show the pertinence of scripture to the world in which you and I live. The relevance of the Bible for the life of the world was given driven home to me repeatedly in October 2008. The event was the World Synod of Bishops on the Word of God in the life and mission of the Church. And presumably because I had taught scripture, my brother bishops in Canada elected me to be one of their representatives at that synod. The Synod speakers painted a picture 
of the complexity of this issue of the Bible today. Many languages of the world still do not yet have a translation of all or part of the Bible. Also, the word is not accessible to these societies and in cultures where most people are illiterate, it's difficult to find readers to proclaim the word. Where there has been persecution because of the word, the Bible has become a threatening document for oppressive regimes. Christian disciples have been imprisoned for having a clandestine Bible. Tyrants have brutally coerced the faithful to deny its content, to tear it up, or to desecrate it. One of the delegates from Lithuania told us how he was put in prison because he could not stomp on the Bible at the command of communist forces. And one of the great gifts for him when he's speaking to us was to bring him that, that Bible and to kiss it and show us the Bible. This only proves how potent a gift the Bible is for the reader or the hearer. The living word has been remarkably effective at calling those who receive it to commit themselves to becoming children of God and disciples of Jesus. Pope Benedict, in a post-synodal apostolic exhortation, synthesized the truths about the Bible as God's word for the life of the world. Verbum Domini, the word of the Lord, is a masterful, mystical, and missionary document. Pope Benedict is a gifted theologian, and this work is one of the finest presentations of Catholic teaching on the sacred scripture. Your follow-up assignment is to get a copy and to read it, at least to delve into it. Given in Rome at St. Peter's on the 30th of September, the Memorial of St. Jerome, in the year 2010, the sixth of my pontificate. With these words, Pope Benedict sends, ends his apostolic exhortation, Verbum Domini. He addresses it to the bishops, clergy, consecrated persons, and the lay faithful, and considers the word of God in the life and mission of the church in this document. The synthesis was released six years ago this week, on Thursday, November the 11th, 2010. St. Jerome is the patron of scripture scholars. His translation of the Bible into Latin is still one of the greatest resources we have for studying sacred scripture. However, it was the saint's intimate love for the living word, Jesus Christ, that characterized and informed his entire life and ministry. Among the many quotes we often hear from him is that ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Pope Benedict XVI, in accord with the Synod Fathers, agrees with Jerome on this point. Only a true pastor's heart could express such a desire for the faithful to fall in love with Jesus Christ and grow in their faith. Only a skilled theologian and seasoned teacher could write this apostolic exhortation with such depth. Yet Pope Benedict teaches on the Word of God in an accessible language that all can read and understand. We might also say that this document is mystical. It reflects someone possessed of an interior life and a relationship with the Lord. Noting in the introduction, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, who gives life a new horizon and a definitive direction. Pope Benedict entrusted his inspired work to the patronage of the beloved disciple John in these words. With this apostolic exhortation, I would like the work of the Synod to have a real effect on the life of the Church, on our personal relationship with the sacred scriptures, on their interpretation in the liturgy and catechesis, and in scientific research, so the Bible may not simply be a word from the past, but a living and timely word. To accomplish this, I would like to present and develop the labors of the Synod by making constant reference to the prologue of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, the, the, the poem about the Word of God, which makes known to us the basis of our life. The Word who from the beginning is with God, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is a magnificent text, one which offers a synthesis of the entire Christian faith. 
From his personal experience of having met and followed Christ, John the Apostle, whom tradition identifies as the disciple whom Jesus loved, came to a deep certainty. Jesus is the wisdom of God incarnate. He is his eternal word who became a mortal man. May John, who saw and believed, also help us to lean on the breast of Christ, the source of the blood and water, which are symbols of the church and sacraments. Follow the example of the beloved disciple and other inspired authors, may we allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit to an ever greater love of the Word of God. The imagery clearly refers to the Apostle John, the author of the fourth gospel, and the posture he assumed at the Last Supper, leaning on the breast of Christ. However, it also reveals the truth that only through a relationship with the Lord, what the Pope calls a hermeneutic of faith, can you approach the Word of God and encounter the living word. Finally, this apostolic exhortation is a missionary resource. It is a manual for the new missionary age and the new evangelization, both of which Pope Benedict mentions. The Pope concludes his 194-page mini-course on the Bible with a stirring missionary charge. I remind all Christians that our personal and communal relationship with God depends on our growing familiarity with the Word of God. The document is divided into three main sections plus an introduction and conclusion. Verbum Domini, the Word of God. A more academic analysis of the Word of God found in Scripture and tradition is the first part. Verbum in Ecclesia, the Word in the Church is the second part, a look at how the Word of God influences the life of the Church. And verbum mundo, the Word for the world, an examination of how the Word of God can be used to preach the Gospel to the world today. The text opens by asserting there is no greater priority than this, to enable the people of our time once more to encounter God. To manifest this at the Synod, the bishops placed the text of the Bible at the center of the assembly to stress and use something we risk taking for granted every day, the fact that God speaks in response to our questions. That's why I put the Bible up there in our assembly tonight, by one o'clock. <laughs> to begin part one, a consideration of this section, the Holy Father looks at the Word of God across salvation history. The Lachim mentions the pattern of history of salvation, looking at God's plan throughout history. He does it seven times. Seven is the perfect number in the Bible. A few excerpts from this section will give its flavor. The Christian faith is not a religion of the book. Christianity is the religion of the Word of God, not of a written and new word, but of the incarnate and living word. Calling to mind these essential elements of our faith, we can contemplate the profound unity in Christ between creation, the new creation, and all salvation history. The word of an author who expresses himself through the symphony of creation. In this symphony, one finds at a certain point, what would be called, in musical terms, a solo. A theme entrusted to a single instrument or voice, which is so important that the meaning of the entire work depends on it. This solo is Jesus. The Son of Man recapitulates in himself earth and heaven, creation and the Creator, flesh and spirit. He is the center of the cosmos and of history, for in him converge without confusion author and his work. Then there is a beautiful quote on Mary's relationship to Scripture. Mary is the image of the church and attentive hearing of the Word of God, which took flesh in her. Mary also symbolizes openness to God and others, an act of listening which interiorizes and assimilates, one in which the Word becomes a way of life. The section about the Word of God in the Church focuses on the role of Scripture in the life of the Church. In particular, it looks at Scripture's relationship to the liturgy. Here are several sections that are relevant for us today. 
a call to forego generic and abstract homilies that obscure the directness of God's word. The document underscores the presentation of Christ as the important center of every homily. <coughs> the document also addresses scripture in its relationship to music. Preference should be given to songs which are of clear biblical inspiration, which express through the harmony of music and words the beauty of God's word. The document also added some practical notes for families. The synod suggests that every family should have a Bible, that the family keep it in a worthy place for reading and prayer. Not just on the mantelpiece, where you put the dates of weddings and baptisms, but a text that can be read. One of my Jesuit brothers when I was in Halifax uh, asked me a question, Terry, how do you decide what Bible you want to read? Of course, the question was not to find out what I thought, but to tell me how to find the Bible. And he said, you need to pick up a Bible and hold your hands. If it's too heavy or the print is too small, you're not going to read it. Don't buy that one. And then we can talk about translation, which is where I go. So every family should have a Bible. It also stresses forming small communities of families where common prayer and meditation on a passage of scripture can be cultivated. Pope Benedict in number 87 expounds on Lexio Divina, the prayerful reading of God's word with a how-to description of it. Christine, the Pope tells us how to do Lexio Divina. The third and last section of the word, in the uh, title of the word, in and for the world, addresses the concern at the root of our reflection this evening. Here the word of God in the new evangelization takes central stage at the very mission of the, as the very mission of the church. The title of this section, The Church's Mission to Proclaim the Word of God to the World. The proclamation of the Word of God is not one element of the mission or one piece of the mission, but the mission of the Church, the mission of the Church. This section sums up many of the missionary documents of the past, Evangelium Unciani and Rigdon Torres Missio, while taking them to a new level. The new evangelization is a situation where baptized Catholics who have lost a living sense of the faith, need to be called back to it. The mission at Gentes is where the gospel is not known, where mature Christian communities have not been formed. To quote, this is why the church is missionary by her very nature. We cannot keep to ourselves the words of eternal life given to us in our encounter with Jesus Christ. They are meant for everyone, for every man and woman, Pope Benedict noted that the synod of the bishops forcefully reaffirmed the need within the church for revival of missionary consciousness. At the dawn of the third millennium, not only are there still many peoples who have not come to know the good news, but also a great many Christians who need to have the word of God once more persuasively proclaimed to them. Many of our brothers and sisters are baptized but insufficiently evangelized. You might see in the following declaration a reference to what you are striving to do here at the Newman Center. The Synod paid particular attention to the proclamation of God's word to the younger generation. Young people are already active members of the church and they represent its future. Often we encounter in them a spontaneous openness to hearing the word of God and a sincere desire to know Jesus. Youth is a time when genuine Irrepressible questions arise about the meaning of life and the direction of our own lives, what they should take. Only God can give the true answer to these questions. On campus evangelization, we read the following. It's not a matter of preaching a word of consolation, but rather a word which disrupts, which calls to conversion, and which opens the way to an encounter with the one for whom a new humanity flowers. On discipleship, it says, you young people need witnesses and teachers who can walk with them, teaching them to love the gospel and to share it, especially with their peers, thus to become authentic and credible messengers. We heard some of that at supper tonight when the young people spoke about what this Newman Center means for them. Pope Benedict's conclusion continues the theme of the Word of God for the new evangelization. 
Our own time then must be increasingly marked by a new hearing of God's word and a new evangelization. The document closes in a compelling way with Pope Benedict practicing what he has laid out as programmatic, using the word of God to take part in the church's mission. Finally, I turn to every man and woman, including those who have left the faith, who have never heard the proclamation of salvation. To everyone the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Pope well, Benedict reminds you that each encounter with the Word and Holy Scripture, history, creation, and worship represents a grace-filled opportunity to strengthen and renew our faith. If you understand your life as a series of disconnected fragments, you deny the unity that is inherent in a life in Christ. This exhortation presents you with the opportunity to understand yourself in a new way. Pope well, Benedict invites you to adopt the Christian paradigm that of the living word. To adopt this way of life, you must hear, see, and touch the living word of the Lord. When you begin to think biblically by identifying with the stories and people found in scripture, your fragmented way of life will give way to a scriptural way of living that allows for a wholeness of existence in Christ. When you become familiar with the word of God in this way, the Bible is no longer the story of an ancient people becomes your story. Hearing the word of the Lord, whether during our celebration of the Eucharist, in the Liturgy of the Hours, during a group or personal reading, <laughs> requires preparation and attentiveness. There are myriad ways to accomplish this, from reading the lecturing text in preparation for Mass, to scripture studies, the ancient practice of Lectio Divina, the sacred or holy reading of God's word. <coughs> The important thing is this, that whatever the practice, you expect that God will speak to you through the Word. Engage the text using all the means at your disposal. And interpret it according to the Pontifical Biblical Commission's document, The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, which talks most of all about actualizing the text. When you use these approaches in concert within the Church, you're able to arrive at the fullness of truth. The Pope reminds you that you risk error when you divorce one approach of interpretation from the other. I will leave a full explanation of the weighty subject of the teaching authority of the Church for another time. However, I'd like to give you a short analogy to ponder. Every sport has three elements, players, a set of rules, and an arbiter. Where there is no arbiter to interpret how the game is played, there would be chaos. It does not make sense for the Lord to leave the faithful without an anointed authority to interpret the word. And that is what we consider the magisterium of the church. And so just as you touch the word of the Lord in the physicality of the Eucharist, so too Pope Benedict reminds you, you touch the word in the creator of the universe. He writes, engagement with the world as demanded by God's word makes us look with new eyes at the entire created cosmos which contains traces of that word through whom all things were made. It is not enough to see the word in your worship or in scripture. You have to see the word of the Lord as the animating and sustaining force of all of creation. In seeing the created order in this way, we will begin to see our world through a new lens, that of the living word. Scripture is God's love letter to you. There is no more noble purpose for our language. Prayerfully devour the word at every opportunity. Fall ever more deeply in love with Jesus, the living word. And may your heart and his heart beat as one. You will see the world in your brother and sister through his eyes. What could be more relevant than that? Thank you, Archbishop Pendergast. We now have some time for questions, so if you have any, you will yep. answer them. How long do we have? Ten minutes. 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 Ten minutes.
wondering um, more about the first one. So, when you talk, like, I'm a catechist in a parish, and one problem I have is, like, people, yeah, they're evangelized and they get lit up on fire, but they're not catechized, and I'm dealing with a lot of what I guess you would call Catholic fundamentalists. They're baptized Catholic, but they pick up the scripture and just take everything, like, super literally. So they don't really know how to read scripture per se. So what would you suggest I do in a scenario like that? Would well, you feel confident to teach them or to share with them the, the fuller sense of the words? I, I try, but they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Send them to your parish priest. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you would do. I mean, I think you need to find out why they wouldn't listen to a wider sense of the church. Uh, maybe show them that the Holy Father reads it this way, and the church has read it this way, um, a fuller way, and then invite them to come along. But, you know, if they're, you'd have to ask yourself, why are they, why are they taking the position they have? Try to understand it, and maybe work with them. Maybe somebody else has an answer to that other question. Uh, well, I have a related question, I suppose. I, I don't know if it sheds light, but it's, um, it has to do with... Uh, have, have you found that there's any ways um, in your pastoral experience that have been particularly effective in introducing people, and perhaps to bring it to the beginning of your talk, the young, uh, to an encounter with Christ through the Scripture? To, through the Scriptures? And uh, Verbum Domini lists a bunch of different possible methods, but... In your experience, has there been a particularly effective way? Well, I try to talk about the Bible all the time. And I preach, and I find that that's not always the case. I think we have yet to uncover the riches of the Word of God. I think we, I mean, I'm not opposed to devotions, you know, but many people have spent much more time reading what Jesus said to St. Faustina and her, her, her mission, her, her vision, locations. And that's that's good, but I, I I find that that needs to go in harmony with with what the Christ has said in the Scriptures. You know? And I, I think the thing that struck me at the time of the Synod in 2008 was we have not yet bought what the Second Vatican Council asked us to, which is richer awareness of the Word of God. It's just not our way of thinking. So when I have meetings and my my uh, staff, we begin with the Scripture every day, every time. Uh, try to do it as a way. You usually try to do it with the Sunday that comes up, the second reading usually, because most people know that the gospel and the first reading are connected. What's the second one have to say? So we work on that. Um, I had a friend of mine, uh, he was a youth minister in Halifax, and he would uh, go to his youth group, and he'd say, check time, got a rosary, got your Bible, you have to have both. And, but that's not very common. I think that's, that's a sadness. I think that's why I picked on the Reformation, one of those things, because it talks about the importance of Scripture. And in our Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation, we lost the sense of the Word of God. And I think we still need to recover it. So that would be my argument about it. But I, in terms of how to go about it, any time I meet with young people, I always begin with some kind of scriptural reference. I try to say, you know, this is what we heard on Sunday, or we're going to hear this coming Sunday. I don't know what they make of it, but anyway, they... <laughs> They don't give me a hard time. <laughs> I guess I'm the bishop, so. <laughs> but maybe other people have ways of talking about this. Yeah, um, you said something very important that may help uh, our friend here. Uh, and it's something that I discovered really, I really understood only when I was in Rome, really. Uh, we hear that uh, the three faiths are, uh, cons are people of the book, but we are not. So the book, the Bible, is not a book written once and for all. It's a living the living word. And perhaps some uh, of your evangelical Catholics don't fully comprehend, you may want to explain what the living word means. It's not the book literal once and for all. It's a perennial message adapted to today's terms, where you find your story. That's very important. That might be a key for you. When I visit with my deacons, they love reading the scriptures and then holding up the book, saying the word of God. That's not the, that's not the right way. The word of God and what they just read is living and active and in their hearts. And so you focus on the book, you're falling into that trap, I think. So I'm telling my deacons, 
Put the book down and just say the word of the Lord. Word of the gospel of the Lord. Because it's the proclaimed word that's the important thing. And I think that's how we, I find, for example, I go on retreat, no matter what time of the year I'm on retreat, I pick up the scriptures and I read it and says, Jesus, God is talking to me right now. Why? Because I put my life as it is now before that word, and the word says something. It always speaks to me. Uh, and there's no other way of explaining it except that the Holy Spirit is at work and the reading of the word. But thank you, Anne, for that comment. Yes? Here in Anaka, Demi, in an academic environment, very often, First derivative students get hit with historical critical study of the Bible, and this isn't what I learned in my church when they have crises of faith, and then when they get into the parish, they have nothing to do with historical critical in their parish ministry. How, what would your view be in terms of how you can integrate the academic side into the life of the parish and the life of the church in a more integrated way? Well, obviously one of my challenges when I would teach uh, I remember, you won't mind my saying this, but you know, Scott, Scott McCaig is the head of the, uh, was the head of the Companions of the Cross, and it's just been made a military and bishop for Canada. Scott was in my class, and I taught introduction to scriptures. It's not the Gospels. He objected to all this form critical, direction critical, blah, 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 sort of that approach. And I patiently worked with him through the semester to show that this does not negate our spiritual sense, but it op opens us up to a wider sense of the text. And then the next semester, when I was doing the Gospel of John, he was there, because he did, found that he could get along with me. And uh, somebody from Wycliffe College got up and said exactly the same thing that he had said that semester before. He said, do you mind if I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> I remind Scott about it all the time. But, we tend to fragmentize, because it's either a fundamentalist reading or a historical critical methodology only. But historical critical is a tool to help us know the church, that make us notice things that we don't otherwise notice. I'm not a big fan of, uh, of uh, the new methodologies of, uh, uh, what do they call it? It's the type of literary criticism, you know, structuralism. Up is not down, and down is in is not out. Okay, I've not seen it. But when I pay attention to all those things, I notice things in the text I hadn't seen before. One of my one of the people who lives with me at uh, the residence in, in, in Ottawa is the dean of theology at St. Paul's University of the Scripture. <coughs> and he shared with me a text from the Book of Judges, which was fascinating. And only with the structuralism can you come to see something we haven't seen before. And it makes us provocative because it says, God is not somebody that you can grab hold of and pinpoint and hold in a box. God is always surprising us. And that's what that text said to me. I don't spend a lot of time reading Judges, but I mean, it was a, it was a fascinating study. And so I'm glad that there are people who have the time and the leisure and the intellectual competence to study structuralism and linguistic analysis, which is way beyond what I learned. I learned Form criticism, reduction criticism, historical criticism, you know, uh, uh, source criticism. I used to teach it, and I looked at it, and I still go back to it, and I, but you know, somebody has to put it back together. There's a professor called Brad, Brad Petrie who's put a book out in The Last Supper. It's spectacular. And it brings a wholeness to this that wasn't there before. So when you disassemble things, you've got to put it back together, and that's really what I think is the next step. The Catholic Church was not familiar with historical critical methodology. We took it on. We bought it all holus bolus, and then we got caught. It wasn't feeding us. Seminaries would take historical critical methods, and they wouldn't like it, and they wouldn't preach on it, and they wouldn't do Bible studies. And I think we missed something if we gone too far. So that, I think we need to bring all the persons together. Yes. Uh, Your Grace. I'm uh, sorry, I'm taking too long. We spoke this evening very deeply about the dialogue between the Lutheran and and Catholic churches, and uh, how they've begun a process of opening up to one another, reconciling. I'm very interested in that ecumenical side of the Bible. Uh, I'm especially interested in the dialogue with Judaism, because I think that our history with the Jews has been not the greatest, bluntly. Let's go right, put it. Yeah. 
And more importantly, I think there's much that we have to learn about the Word of God from our Jewish brothers and sisters, our older brothers in faith as the recent biblical commission, or I don't know, a commission on Judea, Judaism and Christianity said, uh, can you say a word about that? Is, is there, is there a, a larger movement in scripture studies to include a kind of a, a particularly Jewish understanding of how we read, how we, even, even in Christ's time, I mean, Christ is a Jew. I lost a bit of touch with that. I was involved very much when I was here for 12, 13 years with the Christian dialogue of Toronto. And we would spend time more or less dealing with issues of getting along with each other and trying to overcome the hurts that were there in the relationship. But uh, I would often be able to reference some scriptures from the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, if you want to call it that, to my Jewish rabbi friends. And in Ottawa, we basically were spending time working on the life issues, you know, protecting doctors and uh, getting out into this area of uh, physician-assisted death or self-imposed uh, suicide or euthanasia, whatever you want to call it. And, and so we've not really talked theologically about these things, but I think it's an important field. And I, I'm grateful that there are specialists in Canada and states, particularly in states, who've uh, done that kind of work. I think the ecumenical dialogue is very important too. I have to say that when I explained what justification by faith apart from works of the law meant to my Protestant students in the Bible School of Theology, they didn't believe me. They had absorbed a sense that we were saved by works because well, they all come from good practicing Christian families. They all went to church all the time. They all did all kinds of good works. And so in a way, there's always a tendency and a danger in our faith to think that I've achieved my salvation or I'm working on my salvation. And it's always a gift. And that's really what we have to constantly deal with. So I, tease, I used to tease my students about that and finally said, well, thank you for explaining what Paul meant and what Luther meant. You know, sometimes Paul, yeah. even though his background is a Pharisaic Jew, is very anti-Semitic, he's very anti-Jewish. Well, I don't think he's anti-Semitic myself, but that's how people have read him. But I think Paul was basically saying the insight that he had was that although he valued everything he had from his traditional upbringing, discovering Christ was surpassed everything, you know. So he reinterpreted everything in the light of that experience. Not everyone has that experience, and not everyone can accept that experience. So uh, Paul is unique that way. But, but I don't find, well, I, I personally don't find Paul anti-Semitic, but that's, that's my view. I can see how people would draw that conclusion. Yeah. People want to go home and see the election results. <laughs> yes. Um, when I read your title, um, I th started thinking about it in a different way. Because why read the Bible to me should be why, um, how, how, how do we live the Bible today, or why should we live the Bible today? Um, I'm concerned that reading the Bible is very rational, whereas living the Bible is very emotional. So getting into the sharing and the loving is what the Bible is more about, which is more the emotional side of things as opposed to the rational facts of things. Am I getting too far no, into it? No, I would say that we have to hold all of them together. The mind and the heart and the will and the spirit, but they all go together. And I think at one time I focus on one and not on the other. But uh, I don't think anything I said, oh, nothing I said tonight was incompatible with the, the effective dimension of the Bible. Obviously, I uh, was trying to, you know, rationalize some aspects of uh, how the Bible fits with our world today. But we could have taken other, other, other approaches. But the title was one of those things that was patient of different meanings, and I had to focus it. And so I came up with the idea of interpreting for you the the, the, the document of the after the synod uh, for Dominic. But there could have been other approaches, and we could have taken you know, uh, other kinds of approaches, but this is the one I, I fell into and I didn't have time to write another one. <laughs>